Okay, that ought to do it. Everyone else can trickle in when they feel like it. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Elliot. I've been in the last two sessions. You already know that. Um, thank you for joining us here, Developer Growth Summit 2022. And of course, this session, how Netflix thinks about DevOps. A um, few quick housekeeping, a few quick instructions. We are using Zoom webinar. It is completely normal that you can't see other attendees. Um, but rest assured, you are all here, as you've seen in chat from all over the world. Um, chat button is below and make sure you set it to everyone in that side panel over here uh, because it often defaults to just the hosts and panelists. Uh, you'll also see a Q&A feature down below, little button, open that up. That's where if you have any questions uh, for Tejas, please put them there uh, because sometimes I lose track of what's in chat. And at the very end of the session, um, we'll go through all of those. So please feel free to ask whatever you think. Um, we do have a code of conduct as well. So make sure everyone has a great experience, inclusive, safe experience. So please, kind language, um, keep it productive, keep it awesome. Now, the fun part, I want to introduce uh, Tejas Chopra, who is our speaker for this event. Uh, Tejas is a tech leader, a TEDx and an international keynote speaker with considerable experience in cloud computing and microservices, software development, and of course, is a senior software engineer at Netflix. So without anything more, Tejas, please take it away. Thank you so much, Elliot. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen and then we can get started. Um, so yeah, uh, very, very uh, honored to be presenting today uh, on the topic that's, uh, it's, it's an interesting topic in today's time. It's how do you design DevOps in an organization? And some of my learnings and what I've seen at Netflix. So uh, I'll just try to uh, briefly talk about it uh, with the hopes that a lot of this can be taken back to your organizations and you can see if it deems fit to be applied there. Um, the agenda for the talk is as follows. I'll go over a brief introduction about what I do. We'll talk about Netflix, uh, how Netflix thinks about DevOps and how it permeates our culture. And this is an opportune time to talk about it because Netflix has been in the news lately. So, uh, you know, it's it just happens to be the right time to talk about all of this. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. And what I do is I architect cloud solutions to support Netflix studios in the cloud. When you think about movies, right? Uh, and when you think about the process of making movies, artists typically used to go to a movie site, get the camera footage, and then work on the visual effects, animation, and other things on the movie because it's very difficult to transfer data and the data could be a large amount. Uh, this was the typical flow, but today, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. So artists are working from their homes. My job is to build solutions that can enable them to work in the same way as if they were working on a movie site. So this in turn implies that we need to build something like a studio in the cloud. That's what my team works on. And that, those are some of the projects that I drive. Prior to Netflix, I had my experience at Box where again, I was working on petabyte scale data for enterprises. I've worked in companies such as Samsung, Apple, Tencelica, and DHM in the past. When you think about Netflix, right? It's a, it's a streaming service. Uh, it The goal of Netflix, our goal is to win moments of truth. It is to get our customers to look at and watch Netflix when there are so many other choices of entertainment possible. And then it is also to delight our customers. To that effect, we have to design our architecture and our infrastructure in a way that makes it very seamless for our customers to view the movies and get delighted. So when we think about uh, the compute and storage side of things at Netflix scale, we completely use AWS for that. This is not how we started. We started in our own data centers and then we moved to cloud for streaming side, which is something that we're trying to replicate with the studio side as well now. We use Akamai for UI and small assets. And now we've also started using, from a while actually, Netflix Open Connect. Netflix Open Connect is our CDN software that is open source, and it is used to stream all the video bits to cloud, uh, to the users. And if you think about the scale at which Netflix operates, we have more than 200 million members. We operate in more than 190 countries. We have thousands of microservices, thousands of daily production changes. 
tens of thousands of virtual machine instances, containers, hundreds of thousands of customer interactions per second, billions of time series metrics that we capture every quarter, tens of billions of hours that are streamed every quarter. We do all of this with tens of operations engineers and almost no network operation center, which is no knock. If I look at all the microservices and I try to put them in one place, this is how the architecture looks like. There is not a single person in Netflix that knows exactly what this is, but these, this is how the microservices communicate with each other. So you can imagine the scale and the complexity of the services that are built. So how do we do DevOps for such a humongous collection of microservices? The short answer is we don't. We do not do DevOps in the traditional sense. We do not have systems that say no to our engineers. There are no push windows. Everyone has full access to production. We don't take time to build systems or have procedures or policies that prevent people from pushing their code. What we do instead is believe in freedom and responsibility. One of our goals at Netflix is to hire smart people and get out of their way. If I hire someone who's good at what they do, and is intelligent, then they need to have the freedom to solve problems in the way that they see best. We also look for people that take responsibility and do not wait to be given to them. We do not focus on uptime at all costs. And this is a very controversial topic. There are some companies for which uptime at all costs is very important. These are typically organizations in healthcare, in finance. Um, there, the repercussions of downtime are very different. At Netflix, we realize that we price the velocity of innovation. I want the smart engineers that we hire to find new ways of delighting our customers. And as an org, we know that we will have to trade some of the uptime for this. It is not that uptime of a service is not important. It is just that it is not our first priority. It is keeping our engineers to do fun and interesting and exciting things for our millions of customers. We do not actually focus on processes and procedures. It is difficult to have a fast moving organization with people solving interesting problems to have someone build guardrails that are appropriate. This is a bureaucratic way of thinking. One of the functions of bureaucracies is to take that bureaucratic machine and plug in virtually any cog and get the output that the bureaucracy desires. That is not what we are doing at Netflix. So there are almost no processes and procedures Sometimes engineers come together to make a process and a procedure, but this is driven by community rather than uh, forced upon the engineers. What we do really believe in is trust. We work very hard to find people that are not from the bureaucratic machine mold. We want them to question how we do things. We want them to challenge us and suggest newer ways of doing things. So we trust the people that we hire. That's why we do not have issues giving everyone access to production. Well, someone might say that someone can just shut the production down. It has never happened. We do not force people to adhere to standards. We do not force people to use any language or IDE for implementation. We, today, Netflix has a lot of JVM languages, microservices that are written in Spring Boot, Kotlin, Python. I work on a file system that is written in C++ and in some amount of Go. We have lots of Rust and Scala and Node as well. So it really depends on the application that you're building. What is the best tool to take that application forward? What we do focus on is enablement. In the case of my uh, team, we had to write a file system, a file system that could enable artists to store their files locally, work on a movie asset and collaborate with other artists. You can think of it like Google Drive, but for movies. Now, there are many ways to do that. And there are many implementations in different languages. We tried with Java, but the performance in Java was not meeting our requirements. So we went ahead and implemented it using C++. C++ gave us the best performance. And that's why we took a conscious decision of comparing, contrasting with other available languages and frameworks, collecting data to inform our decision, and then taking a call, a, a strategic bet to go with C++. So that's a very good example of where we do not require processes and procedures and where we rely on enablement. We also sometimes have teams that work on tools that enable other software engineers to spend time on things that we've hired them to do. 
Now, this is the most critical part at Netflix. We do not have any silos, walls, or fences. We do not have traditional operational fences where the operational engineering group sits behind a fence over which the code is thrown in the hopes that it will show up in production. What we do focus on is making ownership easy. We believe in this principle of you build it, you run it. If I write code, it is my responsibility to deploy it to production, to figure out which is the right machine to use in cloud, to right size the scale, and to manage all the cluster groups. That aspect of DevOps is the responsibility of the software developer. So in our case, DevOps, development, engineering, all of it comes together under the same person's uh, fold. To that effect, we've also actually open sourced software such as Spinnaker. Spinnaker is a tool that makes it easy for developers to put their services to cloud. It can also be used to put your services to on-premise systems. And please go check it out uh, after this uh, session. It's a, it's a very nice tool that Netflix has built internally and then open sourced for everyone to consume. We do not rely on gut instinct, tradition, and guesses. What we rely on is data. More than anything, Netflix is an enormous data company. We have 2.5 billion time series metrics per quarter, and this is just an operational data. A lot of our decisions is based on data. We started Netflix streaming in 2007, initially from our data centers. And then in 2008, there was a fire in a data center. So we had a decision to make. We could have done data centers and found people to do it. But if our job is to win those moments of truth, then being great at running data centers will not help us get there. So we worked with partners to do undifferentiated heavy lifting for us. We would much rather have them do it and build it. Finally, we moved to cloud. In 2015, we finished our transition to cloud. We look at what people enjoy and watch. And so we are able to produce the kind of stories that people like. Typically, when you go to a company, and I've been part of those organizations where you have a knock center where you have large screens and each screen has different metrics. And this tells you whether a system is operating perfectly or not. Now, if, imagine if you have 2.5 billion time series metrics, it would just take 19 to 20,000 screens that you have to look at every second to figure out if there's an anomaly or not. We are a data-driven company, so we don't have people that are watching that screen all day to figure out if there's an anomaly. We rely on data to drive algorithms and throw up alerts into metrics that can then be bubbled up to the appropriate team. So in some ways, we invest a lot in data and algorithms. And that's what differentiates us from our competitors. So in short, we actually do not really do DevOps. We really focus on culture. The first thing that we do when we join Netflix and when we ask someone who's looking to work at Netflix, we ask them to go over our culture deck. We want to know that the way we think about things is the same way that you think about things. We value our culture very highly. Now, the result of the Netflix culture looks a lot like DevOps. DevOps is a result of a healthy culture and a healthy thinking. And if all of it that I've stated, if none of these principles work at the organization where you're working, you do not really have a DevOps problem. You have a culture problem at that point. So if there's anything that you can take away from this, it's like keeping trust, enablement, freedom and responsibility, and lack of processes and procedures will definitely help your organization scale um, to the well, uh, levels that Netflix has scaled. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thank you for your time today. I am reachable on my email address, LinkedIn and Twitter. And if you're looking for opportunities, and if you're based in the US, uh, please reach out to me for opportunities in Netflix. Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tejas. That was very, very cool to see behind the curtain, so to speak, of what goes on. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, that was my pleasure indeed. You're oh, fantastic. Uh, we do now have time for questions as prompted. Um, please use the Q&A toolbox below. Please feel free to add them if you have any more behind the curtains questions. Uh, let me just pull one up. Ah, an easy one. 
continuous improvement and continuous delivery. What was the tool that you mentioned? Because they missed it. <laughs> from our yes, I, yes, it's Spinnaker. Uh, I think that's how it's spelled. So I'll just send it here. But yes, um, I, I've mentioned it. Yep. Perfect. Um, Jonathan asks, do you document ADR or RFCS? I don't know what's the full form of ADR it, or RFCS. I, I am not familiar with, <laughs> with those acronyms uh, as well. Jonathan, give us some more info. Um, I could, I could, give, it yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could give it a shot. Yeah, I could give it a shot. So um, we, every, it, it's all based on freedom and responsibility, like I said. For my services, I make it a point to document, uh, to write, and for me, I just use Google Docs. There is no format, and this will, comes under freedom and responsibility again. Uh, we, I just use Google Docs to document my thoughts, to document what we are thinking about requirements and non-requirements for a service. Then we collect data, and then we have the concept of informed captains. An informed captain is not necessarily the manager. It is someone who is responsible for their decisions for that particular project. They take into account all the data and then they take a call. And even if uh, folks may disagree, they will disagree and commit to what the informed captain has decided. And it's a soft title, so it can it it rotates between team members uh, for different projects. And documentation or not doc lack of documentation is really decisions that are made by engineers themselves. So, uh, yes. So I I can see some uh, other questions as well here. Uh, do you want to go yeah. over them, Elliot, in the order I, that they're? Yeah. I very much like Dave's question here. What would you recommend um, to a new grad or someone fresher? What should they do in order to dive deeper into DevOps? That's that's a great question. I think there are a lot of tools available to learn DevOps. The idea of DevOps is when you write a code, right? When you write a small code that works on your machine, how do you make it work on every other machine on the planet? That's the idea of DevOps. And now this requires, when you make a change, how does that change reflect in the in, in the cloud or in the backend systems? And how can that change be pushed to everyone that's running your code? So DevOps really will have to do with using CI, CD pipelines and workflows uh, at the first stage. And CI, CD implies continuous integration, continuous delivery. It is as you write code, how does that code get tested? How does that code get deployed to cloud? And how is it available and rolled out to people? Uh, and then finally, it is how do you scale your systems to take into account uh, the number of people that are looking at your services? So I think for a new grad or a fresher, it would really help to understand the CI, CD uh, idea, the uh, use tools such as Git, Jira, Jenkins, uh, and also use tools such as Spinnaker to see how deployments in cloud can work. Uh, what will also help is just understanding the aspects of cloud when it comes to scale, when it comes to observability and alerting and metrics. Uh, they will ho hold you in good stead to understand how DevOps works. Um, it's not enough to write code today, especially uh, when we all are at the cusp of Web3, blockchain, and other things. What is important is, not just write code, but understand how it's being used by the customers and how it should be rolled out. So that's where DevOps comes in. And that those are some of the ways you can learn about it. Yeah, good. Um, Jonathan asked another question. Um, with full, full ownership, how do developers participate in monitoring observability and alerts in production? Uh, so, the way it works right now, I can talk about like the way I, I do it and the way others do it may depend on uh, their freedom and responsibility again. But like we put in uh, observability and metrics uh, in our system. I, I do that. We have open, we use open source uh, observability and metrics tools and some of it we've developed in house uh, and we have uh, ways, we have different languages that are supported. So there is a, there's a Java plugin for metrics. Now my code is written in C++. So I actually worked with the person who wrote the Java plugin to see if I could write the C++ plugin for the metrics uh, library. I wrote that and then I integrated it uh, into my code. Once I do that, I actually develop the alerts dashboard and uh, the alerting uh, emails and everything that needs to come to me. So whenever a deployment is done, we actually check for these different dashboards to see uh, the metrics 
uh, and the observability in production. And once we are we roll it out with a strategy of canaring the changes in 10% of the machines and then rolling it out fully to all the machines. Um, and then once we are comfortable with that, we can actually say that it's a successful uh, production release. That's how we do it. So no, no one other than the developers themselves looks at the observability and monitoring and we are responsible for it. So that's how uh, we we tackle this. Very good. Uh... Arafa asks, when you said devs are responsible for deployment of their contribution at Netflix, does that mean all engineers must learn about cloud computing, um, i.e. no operation teams at, at that Netflix? Is exactly right. That is exactly right. All engineers must know about cloud computing. All engineers that work on systems that have to eventually run on cloud need to know about it. There are some engineers that work on more creative aspects like uh, animation side or visual effects, those run typically on users' machines and laptops. So they do not really have to know a lot about it. The, the simple thing to know it is wherever your code is running, you need to know that environment. So if your code is running on, in my case right now, my file system is running on MacBooks. So I need to actually, I spent a lot of time running uh, or developing PKG, package manager for Mac. I have not done that previously. I had to learn it on the fly and I needed to implement it. And I couldn't rely on anyone else to do it because there's no one else who will know it. So it's it's really, you are building the plane while you're flying in some cases. And there is, there is an assumption that if you're an engineer who's at Netflix, you will do whatever it takes to deploy your code to whichever environment it is most suited to run. Hmm. Very good. <laughs> Mina asks, is it possible to show a high level design of a sample or mock service that is in Netflix's production environment? Can Absolutely. we see that I, far behind the curtain? Uh, I just... uh, it's, I may probably not be able to show it right away because it's not running on my system, but um, I can give you a simple um, example of it. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the example that we are uh, developing right now, which is uh, Netflix Drive. Uh, Netflix, if you can go, you go, you can Google about Netflix Drive. We have a tech blog on it as well, and a talk in AWS reInvent as well. And the way it works is, we have a system where we allow artists to collaborate with each other by dropping their files in a Google Drive-like interface. Uh, it's out there in production. It's not just used for by artists, but it is also used in rendering workflows and in other workflows as well. Um, and the high-level design is very simple. You have a file system that runs on your machine, your Linux machine or your Mac OS, and you, you have cloud on the backend and every file that you change on your system gets automatically uh, copied to cloud. Um, and so it's become, it, it is available to other artists when they sync the files. So you can imagine two artists can concurrently work on a movie and see each other's changes. That's how it's designed. Uh, and I'm very placing it in a very simple way. Uh, there's a lot of detail in detail that goes behind this um, and a lot of design decisions we had to make. For example, a movie file will be very large. It will be in like megabytes or gigabytes. And let's say you change even a small pixel of the file. Now you do not want that entire file to be again pushed to cloud. So we chop the file into pieces and only the piece that has changed, we will just push that to cloud. So that is, you know, just sending the data that has changed allows us to reduce the amount of time it takes to upload these changes to for these changes to get reflected on the other artist's machine and also the performance aspect of it and the storage space on cloud so those are some of the things that you know we've um, we've developed in house uh, some of which we've put in our patent some of which we are working on right now and we will open source the code that we've written so that it's available to every studio and uh, in the world to use that's a very high level example of a yeah. uh, service that is in production. Good, got a good career question there. Um, I'm an AWS community builder on containers. I started learning DSA with Java last month. Can I learn Spring Boot and target a role at Netflix? Yes, you can. And I would like to say that uh, we do not care about the language that you learn. Even if you don't know Spring Boot, if you're good at what you do, and if you're good at what you've learned, there will always be a role. Uh, in Netflix, if you're based in the US. Uh, and uh, we, 
when i came into netflix i have not worked on c++ before and right now i'm coding in c++ we really want to if you're an engineer you're curious so we want to rely on that curiosity for you to pick up anything uh, and you know build things uh, because you're driven by curiosity language uh, can be learned uh, you just need to understand the basics of distributed systems uh, how complexities work in such systems and how to scale them very good we may stop there now people are using the q and a to thank you for your time there yeah let's stop there with the questions very very awesome um thank you so much stadras that was really really awesome to hear what goes on um Absolutely. and especially that the languages are so open um and that the blockers are so removed that's it's quite a rarity in this world very yes. cool um, thank you so much very very good uh we'll wrap up there um if we didn't get to your questions uh, or if you think of more um, please reach out to Tejas after this uh, we'll add some ways to outside contact Tejas in the chat um, yep. but Tejas what's the best way for our audience do you have a preferred social channel or or anything to yeah. come, get in contact with you yeah you can reach on LinkedIn or Twitter I should be available there uh, and uh, yeah please feel free to reach out with your questions Netflix, uh, and if you are looking for roles in the US, please check out Netflix website for careers. Find the one that is more appropriate for you. Uh, and then let me know if I can help in that. Uh, but go over the careers page and then figure out the right fit for yourself. Perfect. Um, did you have any final thoughts or encouragement that you would like to leave everyone with? Just did a pretty good one, but feel free to go again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, DevOps is one aspect of building. It's a very, very critical aspect. Uh, and I think uh, even if some organizations have DevOps engineers specifically uh, or not, I think focusing on both building and deployment will make you a good overall engineer. So focus on learning, investing your time in learning about cloud, about some of these tools that can allow you to like deploy code in production, scale the code in production, that will set you apart from engineers that just know how to write code. If you want to build a complete profile, you need to learn these skills independent of the role that you're applying for. Even if it's an engineering software development role, this will really help you to scale to the next level. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, Tejas. Um, that is the official end of this session. So thank you all for joining. Uh, a you. quick reminder. Thank you. Uh, a quick reminder that we have a swag giveaway going on. So don't forget to use the hashtag DGS2022 in your social posts to increase your chance to win. Um, no real requirements, just use that hashtag learnings, reach out to the speakers, thank you for their time, anything like that. More importantly, with the end of this session, that also brings us to the end of Developer Growth Summit. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to bring this summit to such a passionate community. And I've seen so many of the same names pop up uh, in chat throughout the multitude of sessions we've run. So that's been fantastic. I hope you've all learned something new uh, or been inspired to grow in your own journey. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our normal weekly events, which we've talked about already. If you haven't been to one of our non-conference events, which happen weekly, I highly encourage it. It is free after all, as you can see there. Um, please head over to the Code Mentor events homepage to see what's available and what's coming up and also recordings from past events. And likewise, if you would like to be a speaker in your own event, um, please get in contact with us as well on the webpage. And with that, I will leave the chat open for another five minutes so everyone can network and have a chat with each other. Um, and thank you, thank you again very much for joining us. Bye now. <laughs>